Hi guys, welcome back to Wildebeard Reviews. Tonight we're going to talk about Excalibur, number one, written by Teeny Howard, with art by Marcus Two, the next series in the Dawn of X line of comics from Marvel. So this is this series was probably one of my most anticipated from this whole Dawn of X uh, new line coming out of Hawks and Pox from Jonathan Hickman. And I gotta say, I think this issue was a little bit disappointing for me. And I don't know if it was just because I was a little overexcited for it, or it went in a completely different direction that I thought it was going to, um, but I didn't love it as much as I wanted to. There's still some good stuff in it, and I'm definitely going to keep reading it, if, if nothing else, than to uh, bring you guys reviews of it. Um, but this one delves pretty deep into some past uh, Excalibur stuff, and I think that's one of the, the downfalls of it. I think of the three comics that we've had so far in Dawn of X, uh, regular X-Men uh, last week was Marauders, and then this week we have Excalibur. This one is the most um, inaccessible from previous storylines. It weighs heavily on, um, or leans heavily on, the, the Braddock family line. So that's Bessie Braddock, who uh, is sometimes Psylocke. She has a very convoluted character history. Uh, then there's Brian Braddock, who is Captain Britain, and then their older brother, uh, Jamie Braddock, who uh, has been a on again, off again villain, um, and was dead and now is back because of the five and everything like that. So it leans pretty heavily into that. Also, there is um, Avalon, which is this kind of like pocket dimension. That is basically Camelot for all intents and purposes, with you know even including Morgan Le Fay that Captain Britain is the the protector of. And now I do have a bunch of the Excalibur comics, but I never really read them. Um, I remember reading them when I was a kid, and they are were always a little bit inaccessible for me. I didn't quite like them; they were wacky. And I think um, this might kind of fall into uh, some of those same tropes. So let's uh, let's go through the book like we always do, uh, and we'll kind of see where see where we end up. So I did like this opening, right? So this first paragraph here says, uh, the day of Charles Xavier's world-changing announcement, several of the world's most powerful magic users also received a transmission as Apocalypse introduced himself to his fellow sorcerers. Uh, there's a big, long uh, poem thing going on here, which was pretty interesting to read. Basically, he's saying, um, uh, long have we hidden, um, paradigms have shifted with the shift, um, with any shift, things fall between, um, and, you know, welcome the, 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 uh, the time of, or the domain of the superior, meaning homo superior. And then we kick things right off into um, looking at Avalon and Camelot with Morgan Le Fay here. They are being, uh, the castle is being sieged by, by the White Witch, and she takes um, one of her main knights there, Sir uh, Garrus, uh, to the waters of Avalon and or her scrying pool and basically shoves his head uh, underneath and says you know what's up what is this weed that pollutes the kingdom of Camelot and of course there's a Krakoan portal in uh, the the waters of Avalon her scrying pool so I was like okay this this you know maybe we can we can do this and then we get our, our team list here uh, we got Betsy Braddock Rogue Gambit Jubilee Apocalypse Trinary and Brian Braddock um, so not a, not a half bad team and honestly the team dynamics or what was the thing that was going to excite me the most about this book. I love Rogue and Gambit, love Jubilee, and seeing Apocalypse as a hero was going to be very interesting. Um, so after we go, after we do that, we go to like the Braddock Manor, uh, essentially where Betsy has been visiting and she's packing up to go to Krakoa. Um, and so Megan and uh, Brian, their daughter Maggie, I believe is her name, are kind of seeing her off. And, you know, she's packing up to leave. And she goes through the portal here um, that they they have their own uh, Krakoan portal in, in the back. Um, and Brian says to her... Um, I'm glad you came home as my twin. You're my first roommate, and I still think you are a fine one. Uh, and I've been by you since uh, since day one. But I think you're really going to thrive on Krakoa. Um, and so, basically, kind of wishing her off. Um, you know, you know, go find a home. You know, there on Krakoa. So she she shows up and comes out of the portal, and everyone's just kind of chilling around, relaxing, having some cocktails, um, maybe getting ready to make some more mutants, as has been a sub theme of all of the Don of X uh, stuff going on. 
and people keep calling her Psylocke, and she's like, just just call me Betsy for now. There's a lot of weird naming things going on in here, because uh, then uh, Trinary goes up to Apocalypse, and he says, I prefer you call me this weird symbol right here, which is part of the Krakoan language, uh, which if I thought ahead, I would have translated it. Maybe one of you guys out there have translated it, and uh, maybe that actually says something. You can leave that down there for me in the comments, right? Um, this is kind of a long, it felt like a long comic. Did that feel like it feel like it to anyone else? Like this was kind of a heavy, long one to get to, or am I just super tired? Um, so <laughs> Apocalypse has his own little garden. It's called the Grove of Theoretical Gates, Apocalypse's personal study. Because of course Apocalypse has his own personal study. So he's kind of checking out this one gate here, and he says... Um, uh, men or uh, let's see um, it doesn't go anywhere on this plane with gates opening all over the world did you limit your expectations to this realm this reality and he asks are you familiar with the other world the kingdom of Camelot uh, talking to Trinary and then I love this what he says here men walked on the moon but it was mutants who now build their homes there I love that uh, he says but where else could we build a gate so this one is a one way gate you can't go through uh, through it on their side it seems like it only comes from Avalon into uh, Krakoa, and so they're trying to uh, figure it out. And so this is kind of where it goes a little off the rails for me here. Um, we get some something from the Krakoa and uh, Grimoire's I didn't get a whole lot out of this page. Uh, again, maybe it's just me being super tired, uh, but I didn't get a whole lot out of it. I might have to read this one when I'm feeling a little better. Um, so there's some kids doing some... Uh, basically like some witchcraft or something. It's at uh, Fairgreen Hall in the Moors in North Yorkshire. Um, and basically um, that uh, night that uh, Morgan Le Fay pushed into the portal is showing up there. And then Morgan herself shows up and basically uh, conscripts them into um, her coven and says... Um, uh, until this get until that gate is destroyed, no mortal shall channel the magic of Avalanche. Basically, takes away their magic until the portal in her scrying pool is gone. And she calls um, uh, mutants witch breed. Which hey, that's a that's a strong term there, you know. Um, we do get a pretty funny interaction here with um, Psylocke, not Psylocke, and Betsy, my apologies, uh, with um, Fabian, who is Gold Balls, coming up to her, and she's, he says, uh, oh, I'm going by egg now, and she's like, yeah, that's not going to stick. Yeah, dude, that's not going to stick. Choose a, choose a new hero name, because it's not going to stick. Um, and so he takes her to the hatchery, where her brother, Jamie, has been brought to life, and he's just kind of slumming it there naked having a drink in the hatchery sitting in a puddle of goo i mean i don't know how you guys out there like to spend your saturday nights but hey you know i'll never float your boat man and so she basically kicks him out um because uh fabian is like you know this is a, a place of kind of a sacred place it's the way we, we resurrect mutants and x-men and so she um takes him out um you know pulls him out of there and then goes back to see her brother um as he's suiting up as uh, Captain Britain doing the hero thing and he's got an emergency and um, I love this she uh, basically says um, that she was talking to Apocalypse and <laughs> Captain Britain's like uh, pardon me you were having a drink at your party with Apocalypse yep that's the uh, that's the new normal there on Krakoa and so she he basically invites her on the mission with him and I love that she changes her costume and there's kind of a hand wavy excuse and it says uh, Krakoan costume and technology like they keep their can keep their costumes on at all time and like just change their clothes like that I thought that was um, pretty interesting so they say for Avalon and then uh, teleport into uh, the throne room at Camelot. I believe he has an amulet which comes up later that allows them to transport um, in there. So uh, Morgan Le Fay is there and she basically keeps um, uh, grabs Captain Britain as her subject and says um, um, basically like you're going to kill your own sister for me. Um, whew, heavy heavy stuff and so we go back to the um, the island of Krakoa where Rogue and Gambit are just having a nice little stroll on the beach talking about building a nice little home for themselves, uh, you know, putting down uh, putting down roots. And I love this. Uh, he says, bedtime, yeah? And she says, reckon it is. Don't look too excited. I'm not wearing that power dampening bracelet in paradise. That's not how you're going to make any more mutants there then, Rogue. you got to figure out how to do that. And the uh, buddy does say this. Gambit says, uh, I'm creative. Maybe you won't need it. 
And so um, they get called over because they need something, and Apocalypse wants Rogue to basically suck some power off of this gate and absorb it to try and figure out what's going on. Um, and I love this. Again, they change. Uh, they do a quick change on their costumes. It's a nice little, uh, nice little shorthand for, for the writers and artists there. So... Um, we go back to uh, to Avalon here. Um, Captain Britain is being like fully taken over by by Morgan Le Fay and turned into like her Black Knight and forced to um, attack his own sister, her twin sister at that. Um, Apocalypse connects with um, Psylocke psychically. Psylocke, I'm gonna keep saying Psylocke. Her name's Betsy. She doesn't want to go by Psylocke anymore. So she chucks her um, her psychic sword, which is now a broadsword, which I think is really cool, uh, at the gate, and it explodes, kind of feeding back onto Rogue, who kind of turns into this. Um, let me get this on camera here, like this, like Sleeping Beauty uh, type character thing going on. Not quite sure what what's up with that. Hopefully that isn't permanent because I want Rogue to be an important part of this team. It's one of my favorite characters, right? Um, so she gets out. Um, he she picks up the amulet, and I love this. He, um, Captain Britain Brian says, as now the Black Knight, I think he's called, uh, says, take your trinket. My lady is more than enough. Take it. I beg thee, witch, please. And you can see, like, the pleading in his eyes in this panel right here. Like, he knows what's happening. He's, he's like, you need to be Captain Britain. You need to go take it. Um, and she says, take it where? And... She, he says, take it off, put it on, and be gone. And so, boom, she flashes out. And there's a better picture of Rogue looking very Sleeping Beauty-like. Um, her clothes disappeared because that's how Krakoa works, apparently. And so she shows up, and boom, she is the new Captain Britain. I love that costume design. It's really, really cool. And again, having that broadsword be her uh, her psychic blade or side knife, whatever I forget it's called. Um, really cool, cool character design. Um, so then we get a little epilogue here where one of those students um, is taking back some crystals to her coven or to the place to a, a group of people called uh, Coven Akaba. I am not terribly familiar with that. Um, there's a little bit of, of some uh, like an invocation of the gods here from the Book of High Shadows of the Coven uh, Akaba. Um, I didn't get a whole lot of out of that either. So. Um, this one was not has not was not my favorite uh, of the Dawn of X books that have come out so far. I'm definitely going to keep reading it because you know, give it a couple issues at least. And I'm an X Men junkie. Um, you know, give me my X Men and uh, I'm a happy camper. Um, so I'll keep reading it. Um, but I think what disappointed me the most about this one is the first X-Men story, the first X-Men series, was showing, you know, a day in the life of what it feels like to be a mutant now that their Krakoa is established. Now you had Cyclops and Storm going out there and completing a mission to save some people, but then after that, it, it was just like a family barbecue at the Summer's house, and we got to see these mutants be happy and just live their lives, which is a nice change of pace for the X-Men. And then in Marauders, um, we had, you know, all this stuff going on with Kitty, or with, with Kate, my apologies, um, and, you know, pushing her character forward, and, um, you know, why can't she access the Krakoan gates and things like that, but she pulls together this group, and they go to Russia and rescue some mutants, and that's going to be what that book is about, you know, sailing the high seas, rescuing mutants from oppressive countries that won't let their mutants leave, that's cool, and again, both X-Men and, and, uh, not New Mutants, um, Marauders play into what happened in Hawks and Pox, right? They were basically using that as a springboard. You had your foundation laid by Hawks and Pox, and then you were using that as a springboard for these two, kind of pushing off of that. This feels much more tied to previous Excalibur series than it does coming out of um, Hawks and Pox. So, and obviously it has some elements of that, right? With the gates, and we see Jamie being brought back to life by the five, um, Betsy goes to Krakoa, things like that. So um, it's definitely there, but it's not the focus like I would have wanted it to be. So um, we'll see where this one goes. I'm definitely not going to give up on it yet. Um, it's just issue one. It could definitely uptick. Hopefully it doesn't downtick. Uh, but guys, what did you think about issue one of Excalibur? Let me know all your thoughts down in the comments down below. Thank you guys so much for watching. If this is your first time here at the channel, please consider hitting that subscribe button for me. It would mean a lot. And until next time, we'll see you at the comic shop.